Welcome everybody, the live streamers, the dead streamers, <coughs> to everybody who's in this retreat. Thank you for coming this morning. So, uh, I could now start speaking. So please settle into your chairs or your cushions or wherever you are, and we can start the talk. So, yesterday I was talking about the five hindrances, and those five hindrances, they're important. I didn't say as much as maybe I should have said about them, but it's probably enough for now to get an idea of what they are and their importance and uh, how the are the ones which block us becoming wise, block kindness, block wisdom and block the stillness of meditation. So what I wanted to talk about today, if it comes out, was just how, uh, what actually happens as we go deeper in our meditation. I want to mention this because already <laughs> some people made some questions last night about beautiful lights coming in their mind and they're getting very still and very happy. And I also thought to talk about this because it does actually balance when we were talking yesterday at the question time, or not the question time, sorry, the Sutta class about samsara and just how terrifying it could be if you really understand it more bones that you have uh, deposited on this planet Earth than the, the big mountain of the Himalaya. It's a big mountain. But anyway, all that stuff which we've been through, that all belongs to what we call the five sense world. That's body, that's stuff. Unfortunately, the, you know, there is something more than that, more than bodies, you know, more than tears, more than you know, the happiness of that five sense world and the suffering which they always come together. If there was no happiness, you wouldn't have any suffering. And I remember that from St. Augustine who said that his idea of heaven and hell was that all the good people go to heaven but only for 364 days a year. And one day they had to go to hell Otherwise, they wouldn't appreciate what heaven is. And that's, uh, you know, to me, that was actually quite wonderful that he said that. You can't have your heaven all the time, otherwise you'll get used to it, and you wouldn't notice it at all. All that happiness suff and suffering in our world is a dualistic concept. In other words, you can't have one without the other. And the idea of having happiness ever after, that's impossible. But the other thing is having suffering ever after was also impossible. And that was a bit of a relief. If ever you're very sick and you have a lot of pain, sometimes the pain gets less. That's a kind of relief. And sometimes it just disappears for a while. And of course, that's a huge relief. But anyway, that's just something to do with the realm of the five senses. Now I wanted to talk more about what happens when you leave that world of the five senses behind, which is what meditation does. And it gives a smile on the monks and the nuns' faces when they're free from those five sense world. They're not bound to it. And they can leave it and begin with these wonderful, deep, peaceful, beautiful meditations. So that whole process, what I've done so far is teach about how you can uh, become peaceful, become silent, and then you become aware of your breathing. This is quite common. Sometimes people skip stages, but that is a natural way, a normal way. And I love telling the story that when I first went to Australia as a monk, we had an invitation to try out these sensory deprivation chambers. And these were um, vessels that were filled with salty water, just about the same density as your own body. So you would float in it. And it was at your body temperature. So when you were in it, you could hardly feel any pressure on any part of your body. And it was uh, air, well, it must have had some flow of air, but it was silent. It was dark, there's no light in it. And so it's supposed to deprive you of all the sense contacts, which one normally has, and floating there, you'd have no problem with 
meditating there without any impingement from the five senses. And so I was really excited to go into one of these sensory deprivation chambers or flotation tanks, as they were called. Unfortunately, I was a number two monk, so the senior monk got to go in there before me. And he told me about it, but I never had a chance to go inside that chamber because the following morning, there was a big advertisement in our local paper, flotation tanks as used by Buddhist monks. The guy who owned them, just you now he was on a scam trying to get one of us to go inside so he could advertise that it's used by Buddhist monks. When I told the senior monk I was with, well, the damage has been done. You can't make it any worse. Can I please go inside the tank? He said, no, I never got to go inside. But what I do remember him telling me was that once he was inside that tank, yes, he couldn't feel any sensations on his body. It was like his physical body, the sense of touch had kind of disappeared. There was no sound, there was no light. But he said the thing which really stood out was... <sighs> Uh, his breathing. That was the only thing left. And that's what the mind just latched onto. And I was thankful that he went inside those tanks because it did tell me something I'd suspected. That's why the breath is such an important part of Buddhist meditation. When everything else gets quiet, the breath is what's left. And as you're watching the breath, Quite naturally, got nothing else to watch. That's the one which stands out. As you're watching the breath, because you breathe in less and less, because you're not doing very much. And remember, the thinking, that part of the mind uses up so much of your physical energy. If you're still thinking while you're in that flotation tank, you still need to breathe a lot because you're expending so much energy. So you need the oxygen to. Uh, uh, to do the, what's it called? Oxygenate the brain. Oxygenate the brain, but for the, whatever it is, the process of your body working. But anyway, as you don't think, you can be still, and your body is not expending much energy except for the breath itself and, and the heart. And metabolism is the word I was looking for. As the metabolism sort of calms down, you don't need so much breath which means your breathing gets calmer, softer, and more peaceful. <clears throat> and as it gets calmer and more peaceful, you can, you need hardly any oxygen at all. And that is when the breath becomes uh, delightful, peaceful. So I hope many of you have had experience of that delightful breathing. And it is important. It's one of the reasons why in the Buddha's description of meditation, he always pointed out that sixth and seventh, fifth and sixth step in Anapanasati, which is the awareness of the delightful breath going in and going out. You know, with the Piti Sukha, I don't divide as Piti and Sukha at this point, because the breath appears delightful. And I mentioned that already. But then what happens next? This is, as I mentioned, one of the parts where the meditation starts to take off. Starts to get some really powerful, blissful, beautiful states. The other part of meditation is quite ordinary. But once the breath starts to disappear and you have enough um, delight, enough joy, then that's what takes over. And how you usually experience it is. Uh, with these beautiful lights in the mind, the nimitta, we call them. And I know that one monk was saying, no, the Buddha never taught nimittas. If you want to find out, it said, the Majjhimikai, the Upakalesa Sutta, I think 128 in the Majjhimikai. And there you see all of the sutta, all about um, Upakalesas. These are the refined disturbances of the mind which stops you developing these beautiful lights and taking them into the jhanas. It's an important part of the meditation, which we have to learn, where the body's disappeared, or the body is just a long distance away, and you're with this thing which we call the mind, the jitta. And how it appears, it's, uh, it's we lose our, 
our language in this particular point because in our Western world we are incredibly materialistic, more than you realize. We don't have any words you know, for this part of the mind. So when you experience it, you come out afterwards, what was that? And it is the point that we are mostly visual beings. On our passports, you know, we, we have our face, the picture of our face. We don't have the sound of our voice. We don't have like our fingerprints, even though that could define you just as well. We have the, the face. And I'm looking at each one of you here on the, the gallery view. All I see is faces. I don't see your feet. Maybe next time you sit here to watch one of these uh, uh, sessions, you can put your foot up <laughs> instead of your face. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, two people have done that now. That's, that's <laughs> but anyway, we are visual people. That's our main sense. And that what that means is that me laughing now. What that means is that when we have an experience of these jitters, we usually describe it, we interpret it as best we possibly can. We want to give it a language. And the main language we use is the language of sight. But of course, not always. Sight is the dominant sense which we have. But then in meditation retreats, sometimes people are meditating, they're watching their breath, it gets really delightful, and their breath disappears or is about to disappear. But they even hear beautiful sounds, like in one of the questions yesterday. Not just ordinary sounds, it may be chanting. That's why I reckon the chances are that that person who asked that question, they heard chanting. That was probably the audio limiter because the chanting is something which is more spiritual, like holy. But if you could hear it clearly, it would be just so beautiful, like out of this world. Because this is what you are noticing, something very delightful and beautiful out of this world. And the mind is interpreting it as a sound. So it won't be rock music. It will be something far more refined than that. And then... Uh, even sometimes the people have it as a feeling, but the feeling limiter is a much more difficult. If it is a feeling limiter, if it is all those feelings in your body, only they're not in your body, the body has vanished. It's the nearest you can describe them as. But the lights are the most common because that is our dominant sense. And so when a person sees these lights in the mind, they are limiters, and I encourage people to talk about that because it's part of meditation. There's nothing to be scared of. It happens. And when you know what you're doing, you can take them to even deeper parts of meditation. So first of all, there are many types of these limiters. When they first come up, sometimes because you're not used to them, you get excited, or you get afraid, sometimes they only last a second. And sometimes I call those ping pong limiters. Ping in and they pong out very quickly. But it's still worth it. And a lot of times, if it's some real limiters and it's something you can work with, it's always going to be associated with a lot of happiness and joy. They're pleasant things to watch. That's, you know, you, you have to be develop the beautiful breath, the delightful breath, which all these limiters really have some power. So you're enjoying yourself, they're lovely things to watch. And sometimes they can be complicated. And a complicated limiter is something like you see a beautiful scene, like a valley or some mountains or a river flowing in the bottom of that valley. In other words, they're not just one thing, but many things, but it's still an image in the mind. And this time you should not be that aware of things like sounds or feelings in the body. You may have a few sounds you're hearing or feelings in the body, but they're like distant, a long way away. And you're in another place, a beautiful place, where you can see all these things or you can 
you're not actually hearing it. Even seeing it, your eyes are closed. It's not a visual object, it's a mental object which you are interpreting with the language of sight. And if you do see a beautiful image like that, again, it's too complicated to take deeper, so we have to somehow simplify it. And how the simplification happens is when you look for and notice. You don't have to do this. Just because I've said it now, it will actually happen. When I mentioned about programming your mindfulness, it's amazing how teachers program your mindfulness for you. You look for the most beautiful part of that image. And just the simile I usually give is when I saw one of these nimitas, it was like a scene of a beautiful valley with lots of trees and a little river in the, uh, in the bottom of the valley. And the sun was shining, it was gorgeous. And then I noticed on one of the trees, on one of the leaves on that tree, on the edge of that leaf, there was a dew drop and that sparkled in the sunshine. And my mind got drawn to that. I've been conditioned to look for the most beautiful, like sparkling, brilliant object in that uh, scene. When your mind got drawn to that, that little sparkle just expanded. You zoomed into it automatically. There was no choice in it, it just drew you in. That is wonderful, powerful nimitta as a result. So those beautiful nimittas, you will notice afterwards, don't try and think about it when you're experiencing it. You will remember them because they're powerful experiences. And you, know, you will notice that you know, they are delightful and they're so powerful, they will almost prevent, usually they do prevent any of the five senses from entering. You won't be able to feel your body. You won't be able to hear sounds. You won't be able to, even if you did open your eyes to see vision, the sight has been turned off with the other four senses turned off. You're getting in contact with this thing we call the mind, the jitter. And as one is looking at that beautiful light, there's one thing to say, please don't be afraid. It cannot do you any harm whatsoever, but it can do you so many benefits. And you just have to look in the, the books, look in the, how the Buddha actually taught. Or you, know, you can trust somebody like me or some of the other teachers who talk about limitations. Amazing things happen. Okay, here we're going to go some stories about limitations and beyond. There was this one, this is in the suttas. There was this one monk who was in deep meditation over in, um, in India in the time of the Buddha. And when he was in this deep meditation, uh, some villagers came past him and they saw this monk who was so still, he didn't look like he was breathing. And so because these villagers, you know, respected Buddhism, they thought we can't leave this monk who they assumed was dead. They thought he died. We can't leave him to be eaten by the jungle animals. So they decided to cremate him. They were in the forest, there was lots of dead wood around. So they collected the dead wood. They made a funeral pyre. They respectfully put the monk on top. And then they did some chanting, it's probably wrong chanting, but they did whatever they knew. And they lit the fire. And once the, the fire was very strong, they realized the fire would do the rest. And so they walked away to carry on with their business. Even villagers have a busy lifestyle. So anyhow, they decided just to, um, to leave him, you know, to be burnt. And you can imagine there's a part surprise when the following morning, that monk came into their village for arms. He hadn't been killed at all. Not even his robe was burned. It was all fully intact. Sometimes people think, oh, that's just a myth in the suttas. It happens these days as well. One of the monks I, I knew, uh, he died some years ago. 
he was Indonesian when I met him over in Thailand. He was telling me about his experience before he became a monk. He wanted to be like a Rishi. I don't mean the Prime Minister of England. I mean, excuse me, that's Rishi Sunak. Is that right? Okay, anyway, is that right? Yes, okay, I got it right. He wanted to be like a Rishi who lived in the jungle. And so anyway, uh, he went over into a, pl a place in Java when it still had jungle and uh, went down to meditate as a layman. And he told me how he got into this beautiful deep meditation. I don't mind sharing the story because he's passed away now. I'm very careful telling stories about monks or nuns who are still alive, because otherwise they could get pestered. So anyway, while he was meditating there, he said he saw this beautiful star come into his mind. This, he was an Indonesian, his command of English wasn't great. But he said this beautiful star, and that was like the limiter. And I really liked the way he said what happened next. He said he married that star. That was a way of like uniting with it, becoming one with it. And then when he came out of meditation later, in these deep meditations, you don't know about time, you don't care about time, you're too still to be concerned about time. When he came out of the meditation, he noticed that the area around him had changed. In other words, there had been many, much destruction around him. He'd asked the villagers afterwards what had happened. And the villagers told him there'd been a flood, a flash flood in that place where he was meditating for many days. And he would have been underwater for quite a few days. And because he was in a deep meditation, he was invulnerable. He was sitting there, didn't need to breathe. Peaceful, happy. It's only afterwards, it was a bit of a surprise to him. that the scenery around him was different. I remember knowing that, man. I have no doubt that what he was telling was 100% truthful. So this is just letting you know that when you go in these deep meditations when the body is left aside and you're in the realm of the mind, you're perfectly safe. And I was telling a few people in Sydney, in Australia, because they've had very bad floods recently. I said, look, if there's a big flood coming your way and you can't escape, sit down and get into China and then you'll be safe. It's okay to smile. <laughs> I can't. This is my background. My father was from Liverpool, so he was cracking silly jokes all the time, and that's in my blood now. So anyway, so you're perfectly safe. And what's the point of all of this? But you have those limiters, this incredibly deep uh, sense of happiness, and it's also that you have disappeared much more. Your sense of self is disappearing. That's why I call this retreat, or rather I tend to call this retreat, Art of Disappearing. You, as you think you are, is vanishing. In this particular case, your five senses are disappearing. Your body is going out of reach. And I know that I can see some people here who've got very sick bodies, just old age or sicknesses and stuff. And if you have those sicknesses or old age, worried about being a man, woman, or something in between, look, once you get into these deep meditations, let gender and age disappear, this beautiful mind. And it means that one of the insights, which is very difficult to miss if you get into these deep meditations, you're not afraid of death anymore simply because you know this body can die, but this jitter, this mind, which you are experiencing for yourself, it's independent of the body. It can be connected to the body, but it doesn't have to be. You can be free of it. And so the idea of what happens to you after death becomes very clear, simply from your own experience. You know what happens. 
in death, five senses disappear. And in deep meditation, the five senses disappear. Only in death, the five senses turn on again afterwards. In the deep, so in the deep meditation, the five senses turn on again afterwards. In death, they don't. And this actually gives you a lot of information about the nature of the mind. It takes away a lot of the fear of death and gives you what I call the bigger picture of rebirth. I know that some people say, oh, rebirth, you can't prove it. Of course you can. One thing you can do after experiencing these things like nimittas or jhanas is when you come out of that nimitta or out of that jhana, you come back into the world of the five senses. What you can do, and it's an interesting, beautiful thing to do, is to ask yourself, what is my earliest memory? What is your earliest memory? Normally, you can probably not even remember what you had for breakfast, but when the mind is just so empowered by having experienced like a nimitta or jhana, and those five hindrances have been suppressed. You ask yourself a question like that, what's my earliest memory? And the mind brings up memories from very early on, if not from your previous lives. And the important thing about this is that you're actually remembering, not in the normal way of remembering, where it's just you have a partial recollection of what you were doing when you're having breakfast this morning. This is like a reliving of that experience. You're back there and you can move around and explore and ask questions. And of course, some of you will ask, oh, Ajahn Brahm, can you tell us some of your own experiences of your previous lives? And there is a rule which Shai Chanda knows that I'm not permitted to do that. It's very frustrating. But uh, because I learned the Vinaya, as many of you know, I know the loopholes. And the loophole I usually exploit is uh, when I was first doing this, the first memory which came up, my earliest memory after going into a nice deep meditation, was a uh, memory of my early life, this life. And apparently, I'm not supposed to say about memories of previous lives, but this early life. That actually just doesn't cross that boundary. And this is when I was a baby. I must have been 40 or 45 or something when I got this memory. And the memory was when I was a tiny kid, maybe four or five weeks old, being pushed in my pram by my mother. I was back in that pram as a little bub. And I could explore it. I could look around and see the colours. There wasn't actually any colour, it was just black and white. But one of the things which I do remember was my favourite toy. And so maybe a four or five weeks old kid. And it was a like a ceramic, it could have been plastic, I couldn't know, but it was a ceramic little pig which had some beans or something inside of it, and my mother would rattle it. Of course, I remember its name. It's not an original name, Porky. Porky the pig. That was my favourite toy in my pram as a young kid. But one of the things which I re remembered from that time, which was strange, that everything which I saw, the sight was not so important as the smell. I recognised my baby's pram. I recognised Porky the pig. I recognised my mother by how she smelt, not by how she looked or how she sounded. And that was weird, so I never expected that. And of course, if there was any sort of people who know how the brain develops, the sense of smell is the dominant sense when you are at that age. You recognize your surroundings by its smells, not by what they look like. So <laughs> these, these were experiences which were, so, which were so real. And because the five hindrances weren't there when I was doing this, I didn't realize what was happening. 
but there was no doubt at all. These memories of an early life or previous life are distinguished by the fact that there's no doubt at all that was you. It's crazy, but you know, don't you have any doubt? Are you not imagining things? Absolutely not. And people who do check up on these things, there was one of the ladies over in Perth, when she followed these instructions, she had excellent meditation, and she remembered her early life experience. And as a kid, she was uh, breastfeeding. But when she looked at the woman uh, feeding her, she looked up, and that was certainly not her mother, it was somebody else. So she was quite distraught at this. She came to see me in personally interviews and said, this is what happened. What I saw was not my mother. And she was thinking that maybe my mother is not my real mother. She's not my biological mother. Someone else was. I was adopted or something. And so that was quite concerning. So I asked her, so next time you go back to see your mum uh, after the retreat, just be very kind and ask your mum. Is there something you haven't told me? Are you my real mum? And that's what she did. And so when she saw her mother, you know, she was very kind and pleasant to her. And then she asked her this question. Her mother was shocked. What do you mean, am I your real mother? Why do you say that? And when the daughter told her the experience she had in this deep meditation, and with such deep meditation, your memory is perfect. You recall these things so easily. And she said, Mother said, What did that person look like who was feeding you? And so the daughter gave this very accurate description of the person she saw from whose breast she was getting her early feeds. And the mother was so shocked. She said, I can recognize that woman. That is your wet nurse. You came from a very good family. When you were born, we hired somebody else to feed you. And that's an excellent description of the woman that we hired to feed you instead of me. And there's things like that which just really make it quite clear that when you do get into these states of mind, it's amazing what these things can actually do and how they can sort of solve many problems in your life, but also give you a bigger picture of what's happening. My God, I want some more stories in another time, but I tend to talk too much here. But when these limiters come up, these lights come up, a lot of times people don't know what to do with them. And this is one of the problems. They're so fantastic, so beautiful, so important in your spiritual path. I want to give this, this talk so you know what they are, you know where they fit in, and you know just how to allow them to come in and how to cultivate them. Because this is one of the stories which Ajahn Chah taught us. He said it was a simile of the still forest pool. Now I know that that phrase, the still forest pool, has been used in other contexts. But please remember, I was a student of Ajahn Chah for eight years, eight and a half years, stayed with him, learned from him. I translated some of his talks for him. I understood exactly what he was saying. And the simile of the still forest pool went like this. In those olden days, when as a monk, you would wander into the jungles of Thailand, and again, there were jungles then, and there were tigers and elephants and other dangerous beings. Usually those beings were far more worried about you than you were about them. So really, you didn't have too much to be concerned about. But in the evening, you would usually put your mosquito net on an umbrella about 10 or 15 meters from a, a lake or a river edge, because you would need to get some water. We always had a filter that was part of our requisites as monks, a water filter and a canteen. And so we'd wash, maybe wash some robes, 
fill our canteen up uh, with a little water bottle so we have water to drink. There are no taps over there. And in the evening, once you've done all of that, you would sit in your mosquito net umbrella and then you would watch sometimes as the animals came out from the forest to drink and wash. And Ajahn Chah would tell many times about his delight of seeing the forest creatures. You asked yesterday, can we delight in nature? Ajahn Chah certainly did. And he used that delight as a wonderful simile about nimittas and deep meditation. He said he would be sit very still in his mosquito net umbrella. Maybe there was a full moon up so he could see what was coming out of the jungle. The animals, as they came out to wash and drink, they wouldn't just come alone, they'd bring their family with them. You know, there could be like mouse deer or tigers or bears or elephants, just the whole family. Usually the head of the family, the strongest, would come out first from the bush and would look around. Wouldn't so much look around, but would use their ears to see if they could hear if there's any danger around. And the most dangerous animal in the jungle was a human being. More animals have been killed by human beings than human beings by animals. So if they detected there was an Ajahn Chah there who was watching, even they may have been really thirsty, they would not come out. It was just too dangerous. So he would watch and they would also smell as well. Those were their two main senses, but mostly the hearing. And if they could sense there's a human being there, they wouldn't come out, no matter how thirsty they were. So he would sit as still as he possibly could and he'd watch all these animals come out to play by the still forest pool. And these were the days before Nature Channel. So before National Geographic or whatever people watched you know, to watch the wild animals. And so there was so much fun just watching little baby animals play and fight and just with a mum and dad close by. And all these different animals would come out one after the other as long as he was still. If he got excited and said, wow, they would hear him. They'd run away and not come out again all night. He had to be peaceful. He had to be still. That's where we get the still forest pool from. But then after the ordinary animals came out, then animals came out from the forest. They were so shy. He had to be very, very still for them to come out and him to observe them. These were representatives of nimitas and jhanas, beautiful animals his parents had never told him about. But so sensitive, if he got excited or afraid, they would know it straight away. He had to be so passive, so still. And then they'd come out and play by the still forest pool. The still forest pool represented his mind. The animals which came out to play represented the nimittas, beautiful lights in the mind, and the jhanas. They come out there to play and enjoy watching them so much. And they would stay as long as you were still. The stillness was essential. And I thanked Ajahn Chah for that simile because that meant so much. Now, kind of, I knew what to do. And then those beautiful night lights came up. I imagined I was Ajahn Chah in the jungle, sitting alone, and all these wonderful things were coming out to play in my mind. And I'd only do that if I was perfectly still. I had nothing to worry about. All I needed to do was to be still. And those beautiful experiences will get stronger and stronger and stronger. And again, sometimes you can get afraid for so many different reasons. The first thing which people get afraid 
for is that they haven't been told about these things before. And that's why I feel a duty to let you know that these things are true, they exist. Even if you haven't experienced them yet, you will. So that once you see them, you don't spoil the experience by saying, oh, this is too much for me. No, it is okay for you. It only gives you benefits, no harm. And also, you know, just not to get excited, not to get afraid. You can't capture these experiences. If you give up your stillness by doing something or writing a note about it in some notebook, you've lost it. And the other thing to tell you is that these experiences are powerful. You remember them so easily. So you don't need you know, to write anything down. I often notice that in our English language, we don't have enough words to describe these things of the mind. That's why a lot of time people think the mind doesn't even exist. We don't have the language to describe it. So that's one of the reasons why. And please understand me, I call this experience like traumatic, but totally positive. If you've had a trauma and you've been afraid for your life, of course you can remember it, even though you don't want to remember it. And these are totally positive, beautiful experiences, which make an even uh, more powerful, unforgettable imprint on your mind. We can recall them easily. They're very, very, very pleasant because they're strong. And so when these things come up, you can recall them, you know what they were like, totally pleasant. And the after effects are amazing. That's one of the reasons why that people can cure illnesses. I'm not just saying this without care, because even an Ajahn Chah, because of his monk in his generation, he suffered from malaria. Every monk did. It was like forest fever. And malaria was still very untreatable, but also very unpleasant, and weakened you enormously. And he told me that one day he got kind of fed up with the malaria. So instead of just sitting down and, and just enduring the fevers, or laying down enduring the fevers, he decided to meditate. And I remember him telling me what he did. He went right into the middle of that fever always going inwards, inwards, inwards. And as he went inwards, he said he got to a place in the center of his body and mind where he could not feel the heat from that fever. It was like in that, the eye of the storm kind of simile. He couldn't feel the fever there, but he knew it was there. And he said, as he was sitting there quite comfortable in the center, he could feel, intuit, that the fever was getting hotter and hotter and hotter until it got so hot, he described it as exploding. He didn't die. He was just very peaceful afterwards. And the malaria fever never came back. That's what happens when you do these type of meditations, even when you're really sick. Of course, it's harder to do it when you're sick, but it's not impossible. And again, I, I, I can't sort of find another experience except personal experiences. And that is one of the times when I had scrub typhus, the same as typhoid. When I had scrub typhus in the hospital for about three or four weeks, and this I got zero energy. And after a while, just I got so fed up, it's really hard even to get to the, those were those um, hospitals where there were wards and many beds. It was the monks ward in Ubon Hospital, Northeast Thailand in 1974. Could have been 75. But anyway, as I was laying in this hospital ward, no energy. To get to the toilet, you had to get vertical, first of all, and just lurch the next bed, hold on there for a couple of minutes, lurch the next bed as you work, worked your way down the, the ward, closer to the toilet. There were no bedpans, no one to help you, you were by yourself in this ward full of other monks. 
And after a while of that, you got so that was one of the times when Ajahn Chah, my great master, was very wise, but sometimes I, his compassion was a bit questionable because he came to see me. And of course, when a great teacher comes to see you, you say, Oh, wow. And I didn't realize that, you know, I was so special. He came to see me. And he came to see me and he just said, this little instructions, Brahma Wangso, that's my Pali name. Brahma Wangso, you'll either get better or you'll die. Bye bye. And that was it. And he walked away. You'll either get better or you'll die. The frustrating thing was you can't argue with that. <laughs> but anyway, it didn't help. But when I did my nice, uh, decided to meditate, that was an amazing experience because you were in a bed with a fever. You, know, you, you weren't sitting cross-legged. One leg was one way, another leg was another way. If you've been to hospitals and see people in a fever, and they don't have like anyone to look after them, you are just, the posture is gross. But nevertheless, you, know, you could let go enough to leave the body and just go deep inside and bliss out. And I'm mentioning that not to praise myself, but to say what's possible, even in a fever, even feeling really sick and zero energy almost. And you're still going to these deep meditative states. This out, and when you come back afterwards, and I looked at my body, I've never seen in any book anyone get into a meditation in this posture ever. But it can be done. That's actually where fevers break, where sicknesses can disappear. Now, many times, if you want to heal your sickness by going deep meditation, it probably won't work because there's too much wanting. But if you can learn how to be still and peaceful, even when you are reasonably healthy, it's amazing what this mind can do. You're letting go of the five senses. And your body, and you go into this realm of the mind, it's much more powerful. And it gives you a lot of information and wisdom and insight into what Buddhism really is. Rebirth becomes as obvious and part of that experience. The power of the mind over the body becomes an obvious uh, insight coming from that experience. And just we talk about the negativity about the realm of samsara crying so many times and your bones piled up you know just that is just the incentive realizing that means you don't stay in this place and you find an alternative these deep meditations become one of those alternatives and it's one of the best deep meditations where you realize that this world is subject to disappearance. This world is not all there is. This world is actually a burden. And when you can have access to even the world of the mind, it's not the end yet. There's a little bit more to go, but that's pretty good. Then you find this why. You have monks and nuns who love meditating. And they can be doing so much else in the world. They love the meditating because that empowers them and gives them their own realized wisdom to be able to serve others. Yes, you can find a cure for disease with some new antivirus or something, but to find just a way out for all disease, that is something which is amazing. This is why we meditate. Okay, there we go. Eight fifty. Pretty good time. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. So anyway, afterwards, uh, we have a ten minute break, and then we fifteen. Fifteen, yeah. 15 minutes. And then we do we do a quite a mid. Very good. Welcome back, everybody. And now, having given descriptions the one most wonderful thing to do is actually to turn those theories into reality by becoming so peaceful and so still 
these beautiful lights in the mind come. And those beautiful lights in the mind, these limiters, the five senses don't have to totally vanish when they first arise, these limiters. It's only the five senses get so weakened. Sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touches become so soft, the power of the mind is increased. And that's when the mind starts to dominate your field of perception. Okay. Now, Mr. Teddy Bear, we're supposed to be meditating now, so be a good teddy bear and fish. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so now, <laughs> I don't know if this, if this is a meditation retreat or a comedy show. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> here we go. Let's be serious and get some beautiful limiters. So please close your eyes. When you close your eyes, you're far more sensitive to the feelings in your body. It's like this major sensory disturbance sight is dealt with. I wish I had like eyelids, ear lids and nose lids and body lids so I wouldn't need to, I could turn off the senses so easily. So I anyway, close the eyes. There's one less sense I have to worry about seeing. The two big senses which dominate afterwards are the hearing and the feeling in the body. And if you are in a quiet place or a place there may be traffic noises, but it's ambient noise, and that soon disappears. So the body is the sense which is one of the hardest to turn off at the beginning. Which is why, please get yourself comfortable, as comfortable as you can. You have got an ache or a pain, as long as it just stays like that, it doesn't like throb. It just, you know, it's even then it can disappear. I check my body. Make sure my legs are comfortable. My butt sitting on the cushion is reasonably comfortable. That's a good example. You've got that butt feeling which I have when I start meditating pressure on those muscles. And after a short while, it disappears. My back, my back really nice. And my intestines, tummy, had a very good breakfast this morning. So my tummy and intestines feel really great. My lungs, I do suffer from hay fever, but here I don't need to breathe so much. So my lungs are relaxed. My heart doesn't need to beat very much. I'm not exerting a lot of effort. So it gives the whole body a chance to calm down, quiet down. But be careful about the thinking, the planning. That takes up a disproportionate amount of energy. I think more than any other organ in the body our brain sucks up most of the energy. But imagine your brain. Sometimes I imagine my brain 
I've seen it many times in autopsies and stuff. It's a very small thing, the brain, much more than I expected. I couldn't realize that such a small thing could create so much problem. But just imagine opening up your skull. I imagine it's got a hinge on one side and I open it up and inside is my brain. It's only imagination, like a fantasy, if you like, but I find it helpful. And I pick up my brain, take it out of my skull, and put it into a nice little uh, basket. And in the basket, there's a nice, uh, like a, a mattress on the bottom of the blanket. And I put the brain in the mattress, I put a blanket over it, tuck it in, and say, little brain, have a rest. You work so hard, now you can have a sleep. Because this is not a mental, like a brain exercise. It's a calming of the brain. And an energizing of your own mind. And when my body is nice and peaceful, relaxed. If you've got any aches or pains somewhere, you need to spend some more time on any part of your body, fine. For some reason I've got an itchy nose now. So it's wonderful that you're not watching because I can scratch my nose. Feels better. When my body is peaceful, I look at not just the peace in the body, but the peace in the mind. Asking such questions as, what do I want? Because I know every time I want something, it stresses my body and my mind. Sometimes I ask, aren't you content? Just happy to be here. There's many things to do afterwards, but right now I can be at ease. To retire from all your jobs and responsibilities just for 45 minutes. I'm not going to replace my worldly duties with spiritual duties. No duties at all. My job is not to get somewhere. My job is to be here. I become more and more aware of sitting in this room the Bikuni Vihara in Oxford. It's safe, it's comfortable. So I don't need to do anything except to relax to the max. You start fit to feel peaceful inside your mind. There's nothing to do, nowhere to go. Nothing is missing. Nothing needs to be gotten. You feel peaceful. And all the instructions have been brainwashed into you 
and listening to the talk in the last session. So you don't need to give yourself instructions. It's like you're in a taxi going to the airport. You told the taxi driver where to go. You don't need to give him any more instructions. Just relax and be quiet. I don't know about you, but almost immediately I start to become aware of the breath. You can notice this rhythm coming in and going out. But I'm very careful not to interfere. I'm not going to be a backseat driver and tell my lungs how to breathe. I watch the breath, I don't do it. I'm renouncing all control so I can be kind and gentle. This beautiful kindness to my own breathing. My breath has kept me healthy over 71 years. It's allowed me to build monasteries to help establish a place for bhikkhunis, to teach, to serve. Thank you, breath. Thank you. When I have gratitude and kindness towards my own breathing, it stays with me. We're really good friends. I don't need to put effort in to watch my breath. The breath is just there. And when some joy comes up, my breath appears to be delightful. I pay special attention to the joy which comes up. It makes breath meditation a delightful way to spend time. You're spending time with your best friend. Once you start to feel the delight, the joy, this breath meditation, let that delight grow stronger and stronger. And that will be opening the door to these limiters, beautiful lights which come up in your mind. I will have to be quiet now give you the opportunity to develop this peaceful, gorgeous meditation.
getting close to the end of this meditation period. How do you feel? If you have the opportunity, you can meditate more. And of course, please, please do so. Those who do have other duties to perform, slowly open your eyes. And come back to the world. Whatever you experienced, this is where we learn the power of peace, stillness, and the joy of disappearing. Thank you for listening.